satisfação, vamos dar início à nossa conferência magna da reunião magna, ou seja, uma das conferências mais importantes que nós temos durante a reunião magna é a conferência magna. O nosso conferencista é o doutor Ernesto Fernandes Pulkosch, que trabalha na Unesco, em Montevideo. Brevemente, o professor... Oh, desculpe, o doutor Ernesto Fernandes Pulkosch, da Unesco de Montevideo, é um diplomata científico, ou seja, um diplomata de extrema importância, porque cuida da parte científica, certamente. É especialista em políticas públicas para ciência, tecnologia e inovação. Foi chefe da Sessão para Políticas Científicas e Parcerias em Ciências Naturais da Unesco, onde atuou junto a programas de políticas públicas, comunicação científica, e gênero e ciência. Atualmente, veja que um conjunto extremamente relevante das ações deles. Atualmente, o doutor Ernesto é diretor regional de ciências da Unesco para a América Latina e Caribe. Doutor Ernesto, sinta-se em casa, o palco é seu. Muito obrigado. Vou sentar aqui. Graças. Bueno. Muito obrigado. Eh, muito obrigado pela invitação. Eh, I will speak English just because meu oportunidade não, 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 não alcança para, para uma apresentação séria. Eh, eh, mas gostaria de agradecer muito à Academia, eh, a Helena, a todo o todo, equipo. Não quero. Quiero nombrar porque a todo el equipo por, por la invitación y a todos los amigos, las amigas aquí. So, um, I, um, I will talk a little bit, very much in line with uh, with the conversation I think that we were having this morning about um, the hunger in and the relationship with science. Now, in a, in a broader view, and I've seen the um, the program of the activity yesterday and the day before and and trying to look into the um, into this relationship also um, uh, professor uh, Siqueira no that's it uh, professor Siqueira also mentioned the science to policy and i will i want to to go around that idea and to talk a little bit about Uh, not only the relationship between science and policy, but also the relationship with science and society and how this all interacts in this uh, idea of, of open science. So, uh, I think this is, yes. So, I also saw that already yesterday uh, uh, or two days ago we had a, um, a discussion that included the right to science, but I always try to start this conversation uh, on, on the idea that when we talk about science, we are not talking, uh, we're talking really in the framework of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. This year is 75 years, and we, it's always nice to remember that Article 27 um, um, talks about the right to science, the human right to science, and that this is the framework of our work, both me as a science policy, science diplomat, science bureaucrat, as you as scientists, we're all in this framework of the Human Rights Declaration. And as it says, we have, everyone has the right to freely, freely to participate in the cultural life, to enjoy the arts and to share in scientific advancement and its benefit. And I think we understand that today, not only as the right to, to benefit from science, but also to participate, to be part of science. And we see when we discuss open science, and I will come uh, back later, uh, this openness as the way to everyone be part of science, scientists and society as a whole. Um, And if you've seen, there is a booklet, a very nice booklet on the Human Rights Declaration, which you can look up on the website. It's, it's very nice with, with well um, explained all human rights. So 
The second framework in which uh, today we are discussing uh, the role of science is, uh, it has been mentioned probably a thousand times in these three days, but I want to go back, the 17 um, de Sustainable Development Goals of the 2030 Agenda. Sometimes um, we say the 2030 Agenda of the United Nations, but it's not, an, uh, it's not at all an agenda of the United Nations. It's an agenda of all member states of the United Nations, of all the countries in the world that have uh, taken up the the um, the all the objectives, all the goals, and made them their own. So it's it's the goals of the countries, of all countries in the world. And uh, today we were discussing about one of the goals, about hambre uh, cero here in Spanish, fome um, cero, no, for for the conversation this morning. So. Uh, one of the clear issues about the Sustainable Development Goals is that not only they are all interconnected, but they all, all of them need science, scientific knowledge, new knowledge, new knowledge development to be uh, to reach. So this is new to the international agenda. The, uh, some of you might remember that before the Sustainable Development Goals, we had the Millennium Development Goals, which were less, but they were also much more oriented towards developing countries, and especially for those of us who have worked uh, during so many years on, on how to uh, uh, develop science, on science policy, and then promote international uh, science, it was very difficult to explain in the framework of the Millennium Development Goals why we thought it was important to develop science. The Millennium Development Goals were much, had another framework, and really, uh, frequently, when working in, in the framework of UNESCO, uh, uh, of course, my colleagues who worked on education had an education goal, but uh, when you work on science, it was very difficult to explain how you were, your work was important for the Millennium Development Goals. Today, with the Sustainable Development Goals, it is clear to everyone that science is in the roots, in the, it's, it's, a, it's one of the main tools for, to achieving these goals in the countries and at global level. So this is, is very important because it, 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 I think it gives, a, it gives the framework to everything we were doing. It was very well discussed this morning too, what is the role of science for hunger? Well, I know you've been discussing this the other days too, and it, it opens new avenues for international work on these issues. At the same time, there is one goal, or at least at least one goal, which is goal number nine of innovation and infrastructure, I think, yeah, uh, which explicitly mentions in, in, in two of their indicators the um, our classical scientific indicators, yeah, R&D expenditure and a uh, number of researchers. So not only is there, um, an idea that science is part of all the indicators of all the goals, but in one of the goals, the achievement of the of the SDGs is linked uh, explicitly to the development of science. And uh, here I I don't like uh, slides with this much text, but I thought this is a transcription of the of the goals verbatim from the. From, from the SDGs so that you can see uh, how this is recognized in this international framework. And how we see, how this, how this means that the concept of the Agenda 2030 really links uh, science to, uh, to the, all the goals. Uh, also, taking into account, as I said, that all goals are seen as interconnected. Well, yes. Um, And so let me just give you a few numbers of these goals, just to, as a context. And this is a very nice website. I, well, it's not quoted, in, it should be, but the uh, SDG tracker, where you can see that the indicators of all the SDGs per, per country. And here we have the R&D expenditure. Uh, here I, I put a little bit bigger um, South America, but uh, you can see that 
uh, we are still very far away from the dark uh, green of the more developed countries, but well, at least Brazil shows uh, for the data that we have in 2019 at the global level, uh, uh, shows leadership in Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, these data are produced by UNESCO also in the UNESCO Institute for Statistics and are part of one of our reports. I have brought a couple of, of these, um, uh, which is the UNESCO Science Report, which is published every five or six years. And um, I have a couple of, the, of, of this, if anyone wants them, but they are also on the web. So. Uh, you know this. Uh, this is the number. This is the R and D density of, of researchers. I like to say that this is the probability of when you jump, when you when you meet someone in the bus that that person is a scientist. No, and um, this uh, probability is, is, is higher in the case in in Latin America. We see that this probability, for instance, is higher in um, Argentina than, than in Brazil, while the expenditure is, is higher in Brazil. Uh, but you can see also the comparison with, with other countries, and of course, always a lot of countries without data. Um, the, the third one, well, this is, this is an indicator for, for the SDG 17 about uh, manufacturing value and high-tech industry. Uh, there are a number of, of, of goals, this is the the, um, the uh, another as part of the goal 17, another mention discussion to um, indicators of uh, technology at least. So science, technology, very present. Another issue I didn't want to, <coughs> although it's not in the SDGs, but uh, as an indicator, but I wanted to, to, to bring it forward is the percentage of women that are scientists. We were discussing earlier today uh, the, this, this question, and, but it, it talks to two different uh, uh, SDGs, which is uh, SDG 9, which in Industry Innovation Infrastructure, which is what I was talking before, and 5 on gender equality. So. Um, I'm not sure. I, this, this, when I see this graph, it, it lacks the, um, the, the, the color explanation. But uh, overall, Latin America, we don't have good data for Brazil. And uh, the, um, overall, Latin America is in a better shape than, than other regions in terms of, of the percentage of women. Latin America and the Caribbean is around 45%. Uh, so there is a, almost a parity uh, while uh, other regions, uh, particularly um, in Europe, are not that that well. Uh, this is also related to not only the the overall percentage, but the different types of, of uh, gaps, both horizontal and vertical, in the different uh, disciplines. When you look at why Europe has this, uh, this is much worse than Latin America. In Europe, for instance, the number of engineers is much higher in, in the research force, and the number of women in engineering is much less, and this affects directly the whole, um, the whole picture. But the, the, I'm sorry, I, I like this, uh, this, present, this part, and I take too much time, but I will move forward. While we were discussing this implementation of the SDGs and how to move forward the science in the SDGs and the science uh, for the SDGs, no? the science in the SDGs as in these indicators and the science for the SDGs as in the science we need to combat hunger, for instance, uh, what happened? You know what happened. So the, in, in, in the middle, this, we started this, this conversation in 2015, and uh, only less than, only five years later, uh, COVID happened. So this, not only did COVID change the, um, the, um, uh, the material reality, but it also changed uh, f fundamentally, uh, culturally, a certain type of relationship between the um, society and science. What, what happened after COVID, we were all over breakfast discussing the difference between virus and bacteria, what is a PCR and what is antigen and antibodies, and suddenly these questions uh, became, uh, became uh, an everyday discussion with 
and with a lot of misinformation, misuse of, of, of uh, bad information, but um, I think um, it, it really changed the way a, a good part of society started perceiving their relationship with, with science. And in some cases, also the government, some governments more, some governments less, establish a different relationship with science. No, I, I will, being here in Brazil, I will not talk about Brazil, if I may, but if you, if that's okay. So for instance, in, in, in Uruguay, I, I was not in Uruguay at that point, I was in, in Peru where the situation was very, very dire, but um, in Uruguay, the, the establishment of an advisory, scientific advisory group to the president uh, made that the whole the, the response to the COVID crisis in Uruguay was uh, really evidence informed. Sometimes, and this the interesting part of the of the establishment of that group was that the president told the group that he would always listen to them, but not always do what they told him to do. No, and this is part of this uh, the, the cycles that uh, Professor. Um, Siqueira was presenting this morning about the difference with science um, and the political will and the societal infrastructure. So, uh, so a part of the science did not go to the political decision, but there was a certain part where that uh, uh, there was an intersection between science and um, and political will, and this helped strengthen the quality of the response and showed a clear, I think, uh, a very good uh, result in terms of uh, the, the policies and the strategies put forward in that country. Many other countries have followed similar um, approaches. Uh, some, uh, some other countries, in some countries, one could watch over time how the relationship between the, the policies and the and knowledge evolved in a sense that at the beginning the conversation was only with a virologists and then with epidi then epidemiologists and then uh, sociologists and economists. No, they were like coming into the picture late, but uh, and and where those where those uh, where the social scientists did not come in. Uh, um, frequently, also um, uh, governments made, made mistakes. The, the case I can I can talk about in in Peru was very interesting because they decided that um, on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday uh, only men could go to the shops, and on Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday only women, in order to reduce the uh, number of people in the shops. What happened? Of course. Monday, Wednesday, and, and Friday, there was no one in the shop. And uh, Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, and this is, it's, it, it sounds like a, jo a joke, but it's not a joke. It, it, culturally, in, in Peru, it is the, the woman who goes to the shop to, do the, um, to, to, to buy. So eventually what happened is that people were more concentrated on those three days than they would have been if they had been uh, distributed throughout the week. Yeah? So it was a measure that someone uh, uh, somehow considered could be a useful uh, idea, but really it developed into a bigger problem, and they had to then cancel it and go back to other types of, of regulation. So sometimes you do need a psychologist or a, or a sociologist uh, to assess, uh, to be part of this team. And by sometimes, I mean always. So um, this is uh, this type of, of, of examples, which, which are small, but have to uh, have also been cases in in other countries where you really saw how it evolved from this emergency explain me what the virus is to how do we really set policies that are um, a sound and can really solve a, a, a policy problem for the whole of society so in that framework also and um, this is this is uh, another of the points. Uh, uh, the International Year of Basic Sciences for Sustainable Development was 
in 2022. So at the in the in the last part of the of the um, uh, pandemic and very much in terms of the discussions and the 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 whole the the, the definition of this uh, magna conference, this magna reunion magna, no, this uh, a big meeting. Um, it, it was very timely to, and it was planned already before. So we, it's not that uh, this was the um, um, that this was improvised on time, but it was really timely that uh, the discussions at the global level came to this idea that the 2022 should be the year about what the relationship is between basic sciences and. Um, sustainable development. So we have, um, there were a couple of issues that UNESCO was the, has been, and somehow 2022 started mid 2022, so we're still in that year. Yeah, and, and we might still consider ourselves for some time because it is a very strong message. And, and I think I, I was very, very uh, happy to see that, that uh, being reflected in the, in the concept of this, of this conference because uh, as we say, w the key issues in, in the relationship between basic sciences and sustainable development are about enhancing the, 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 the participation in science. I mentioned the right to science, strengthening education and scientific training. We will discuss this this afternoon. Um, financing basic science as well. This is the discussion we've had forever, so it's still, we still need to, to, to bring that up and generalizing open science as one of the uh, new um, views that we want to bring uh, on the table, and that is the second part of, of uh, my presentation today. So just to, to give a few other uh, issues about uh, say the, the, the year, uh, here you can see um, basically including the meeting global challenges. So this discussion between the local and the global challenges, which I think is in a country, in a global country like Brazil, it's, it's so important because you have the, uh, it's, it's, it's very, it's a big contrast when I spend my normal days in, in Uruguay. I'm not from Uruguay, but I'm spending my normal days in Uruguay, which itself considers itself, and they say, un paisito, no? The, uh, a small country. And they, bienvenidos al paisito. And when you come to Brazil, it's not exactly that, no? So that contrast between, uh, between uh, the, the locality of a small country and the lo local concepts of the big country and how the local concept of a country like Brazil are so close to the global uh, uh, issues. I think that for science, this makes a, a, a big difference. And I normally, when, when I show the indicators that I showed before, uh, I, I won't go back in the, in, the, in the slides, but when we look at the investment of, um, of countries in Latin America and the Caribbean, and we look at the global and the local challenges that science is asked to contribute to, uh, such as the response to the to the pandemic, the response to uh, now in in many of the countries the different the the the, um, the problems with with water scarcity and uh, and uh, and we could say with with hunger. So those those problems that that science is called to respond to um, cannot be responded by local small local scientific communities alone. Uh, the importance of international cooperation, the, inter the, the importance of, w when we look at the data, uh, okay, I, no, I won't, I won't go back, but you saw the data. The data show uh, a weakness in the science and technology systems of most countries in Latin America and the Caribbean, and we cannot think that the, the problems that are related to the sustainable development of the countries, which are very big, and we heard how big the, the problem of hunger is uh, this morning, it cannot be solved in almost all countries, uh, and I would say also not in, in Brazil, only by the, the scientific community and the scientific uh, capacities of one country, but through an, um, sound and, and open and, um, and in, 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 a, 
in a brotherly, sisterly manner between the scientific communities of all the countries in the region. And I think that this, this, is, this is part of when we look at the data, that the data should not depress us, but should uh, uh, bring us to the question that if we want to really uh, build responses to the to the challenges we're getting. We need to cooperate. We need to establish new ways for cooperation, new uh, tools for cooperation, and new open policies for cooperation. Um, so this, and so here I go to to the part on open sciences. Sorry, um, where. Also in the framework of the, of the crisis, also in the framework of the COVID uh, pandemic, uh, UNESCO in uh, 2021, in 2021, so in the middle of the pandemic, at, the, at our general conference uh, in Paris, uh, we approved the UNESCO recommendation on open science. And this is um, a standard setting instrument, no? and on overall, first of all, I, I, a recommendation is something that is in between a declaration and a convention. Yeah, a declaration is something that is a, a number of, of uh, principles that are declared. A convention is something that goes into the legal framework of the countries that sign up to the convention. And a recommendation is a standard setting instrument that is monitored by uh, UNESCO in this case, uh, but it's not mandatory, but the countries uh, do um, sign up, but they, and, and there is an instrument to monitor to see how uh, the uh, recommendations are put in place by the countries without any power of uh, uh, mandatory implementation, still there is this uh, idea of monitoring. So uh, having said that, uh, when we were discussing open science, b way, way before the pandemic, and at that point I was in, in Paris uh, and in, as the chief of science policy and partnerships, as, uh, as was mentioned, and, and I was part of that discussion quite um, fundamentally, we, didn't, we had no idea what was coming at us, but nevertheless, uh, I think that the, it was very timely, again, to have had this uh, recommendation put forward to, to the world, giving not only a number of, uh, a set of uh, definitions and uh, values and principles, but from my point of view, a proposal for a different paradigm on how we look into the relationship between science and society from, uh, and with new tools for the policy for science and technology. So how do we do science policy and how do we think about science policy can, can be seen a little bit different if we follow uh, this recommendation. That's why I wanted to, to talk a little bit about the recommendation. Uh, um, this is the first international normative instrument. There is an internationally agreed definition. Uh, there is consensus. I want to also mention that uh, having a consensus or, on, um, on a concept like open science in a forum like UNESCO with 193 countries, which not all of them have the same uh, concept of openness, yeah? Um, the, at the table, you have uh, both China and the European Union and Russia and Latin America and we had to agree about an idea of what is open science between, and of course, all the African countries and the Arab states. So there, is, uh, there are many different ways of looking even at open sharing of information. No? So it was not an easy process. And, and uh, it really came up with an internationally agreed definition on some values and guiding principles. The, the need to, to involve many actors, and this is very important. I think the openness is about actors. It, for us, and I will go back to this later, but the openness of open science is not just the openness between researchers, no? and, but uh, the openness between research and society. It's not only uh, to be open in sharing uh, data or publication between uh, researchers of different uh, institutions or countries, but also between science and society. So um, this and here I said, I will try to find the definition of open science. 
Well, this is the, no, no, don't take a picture because this is the definition that I found with uh, <laughs> So, um, this is not the definition we're using, but it, it, it is a, a way to define, I asked Ch ChatGPT uh, what are the indicators of open science, no? And, uh, uh, I, sorry, no, I want to go, I uh, hear this is going back. So uh, this is what ChatGPT was telling me. Yeah, this is not the, what what we were saying, and I wanted to to bring this uh, forward because it is actually uh, what I was uh, talking about before. It is about uh, open science in terms of uh, openness between um, between scientists. It is very well in line with the European discussion, but we were looking for something that goes beyond. The um, the so you you can take pictures. I just wanted to say that don't don't uh, think that this is uh, what the, my message. Uh, but it's interesting, no? It's uh, I asked. It was way longer than I asked ChatGPT. Say it shorter. It's interesting. Eh? How how I don't know if you have tried it, but um, I saw that the, there was a conversation on ChatGPT Chat on on Monday. Well, I thought I will do the. Um, the exercise for for you today on this, but but it's it's there is quite a, a number of interesting things there. So now, what what the, what does UNESCO or what do the the UNESCO men, member states say about what is? Uh, and here, please take pictures. Uh, this is all on the web, and I will share with you the the. the I'm happy to share with you also the the presentation. Um, so. As you can see, we're talking, talking about making scientific knowledge openly available, accessible, reusable, uh, increased collaborations, uh, sharing information uh, for the benefits of science and society, open, open the process of scientific knowledge creation. And this is the other big point that I haven't talked about, about the process of science. No? Uh, frequently, we think about science uh, particularly when we're teaching science to, in schools or so, it is about the results of science, about what the, the, um, and not about the process of science. And I think that part of getting um, science closer to society, and it was also very well uh, shown during the pandemic when we started, uh, when, when the message from science started changing. No, at the beginning we thought it was the, the big droplets and that meant that we had to we had to clean all the all the um, all the clothes and the f and the shoes and everything, and then the message was evolving towards that ended up with the with the masks. No, and and if you remember, we think that we have been using wearing masks forever, but at the beginning we were going out without the mask, but but having to clean our uh, the hole because of the whole discussion about big droplets and uh, and and um, and the, how how the virus was carried. In the in the air, so uh, that also showed how the process of science was happening, and it was showing to society the process of science in real time. It was one of the first time, if not the first time, where the process was so clear. It, 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 of course, it was very difficult to understand for people because we had never discussed properly what the process of science is. We had discussed the results of science and the formula, and science was a formula that we were teaching and not a process. Opening the process is a lot about building this relationship between science and society. And so, and also in the last, the last uh, bullet point, the um, it's, uh, science communication and uh, going beyond the traditional actors of the scientific community. Well, uh, this donut, as I call it there, I don't know if this is, no, um, of the four colors in, in terms of what these four pillars of open science that we have in, um, identified, I wanted to also briefly stop at that. I still have a couple of minutes, I think. Um, open scientific knowledge, which is basically what we have been discussing before. This is uh, the, S, uh, the, the, the open access, open data, uh, open resources, open software, 
but also open science infrastructures and open open labs, sharing of uh, of infrastructures. Uh, and now, yeah, there are the, the 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 other new types of open services of of R and D services that that open and 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 many other ways of sharing uh, science infrastructures in an open way. Um, the, the, the yellow part of the open engagement of societal actors, and here I think one of the stronger ideas is uh, citizen science and how we engage citizens in the, uh, in the process of science. Not, not, and some, some of the citizen sciences we are seeing are very, very shallow, and, but some go way deeper into the participation of citizens in uh, the citizen science exercises. But there we should also, uh, we should not forget uh, science education and science communication broader as part of this yellow uh, uh, open engagement of societal actors. I think that there, the, this engagement of societal actors is, is, is key to the paradigm of open science. Uh, and then the other point is the dialogue with other knowledge systems. And here, we, uh, I, I know you have been discussing yesterday about indigenous communities and indigenous knowledge and this dialogue between the different systems of knowledge, between the scientific knowledge and the indigenous knowledge is also, and the local knowledge and sometimes traditional knowledge and different ways of calling, and, but different uh, approaches to uh, knowledge is also another part of this opening. This opening, not because not saying that this is all the same and we should all, and it's the same to do one type of knowledge or the other, but this dialogue, establishing a dialogue, learning from each other, particularly in terms of uh, climate change adaptation. Uh, we have there a very strong opportunity for, for learning, but also, of course, the traditional, uh, more traditional approach of medical uh, products and so on, and nature medical products. But also, some of the dialogue uh, which is, also interesting with the marginalized scholars, which are sometimes those that bring uh, uh, different uh, approaches. But uh, and and the, and the, and the, another one that is missing there is also this technology technology dialogue, for instance, that happens more uh, at at the, um, with the practitioners of technology, which are the workers in the factories, and this dialogue between the. Um, the engineer and the workers uh, around how to improve uh, and, and to some extent moving towards an open innovation dialogue in that sense. Beyond the other in open innovation, which is there in the green about open source, no? the clear, the, 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 the Linux, uh, Linux uh, case as a, as a typical uh, idea of, of open source. But going beyond that into open innovation, in sourcing ideas, in, in opening to different points of view, I think this this gives us an a, 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 we we for our understanding this gives us a very strong framework on how to organize our policies towards this relationship between uh, science and policy. There are some uh, missing links there. I like to think. And uh, maybe they are in the in the yellow part, which is about the science advice as a practice. The science, this 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 who does this relationship between science and policy? It's not only the science the science to policy that was mentioned this morning does not just happen. It requires institutions. It requires practitioners. The academy, of course, is one of the main institutions for that. But uh, and then there are the the other types of the, the science diplomacy, the the use of science in external relations in uh, to to not only to get more or less a scientific cooperation, but also to think about how science can affect uh, the, the international relations uh, of countries. So those are things that I, I, are there for a recommendation 2.0, but uh, at least I think that the, this type of, of, of uh, a structure opens new ideas, new, opens new ways of looking at science and technology policy, particularly for developing countries. Um, because the values that we're looking at, we we all agree, uh, I think, on these on these values and on, on these principles. Uh, these are uh, general. Uh, I think we. I see here that I'm almost over with my time, so let me just uh, go quickly. Uh, what? How to go from? Um, 
the um, the the recombination to the implementation and one thing is that we need to to also look at what is what could be negative on these open sciences and we have all the issues of intellectual properties and if we if we jump there uh, to the chat gpt um, example i gave before we don't know where that uh, phrase comes from we don't know who wrote the terms that are used in that phrase that I was showing in, in the chat GPT, it is open, it is taken, but it is not uh, explicable, and it's also at the same time, it's not recognized who, who whose, uh, whose um, intellectual property is behind, not, 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 not only in economic terms, but particularly in recognition terms, it's, it's not there, no? And so, the, the opening, this is based, uh, chat GPT, based on open, uh, openly available information, but then what about the, the, who is behind that, that knowledge? So, uh, and for that, uh, I, will, I will jump. This here, if you, here it's uh, particularly uh, for your pictures. If you wanna, we have five open science working groups uh, uh, set up, and these are open, open science working groups. So everyone is invited, also the academy as an academy is invited, and, and there are many of you perhaps already involved. Uh, that uh, QR has a, a link to the, um, to, to these working groups and to how to participate um, in, the, in the groups. Um, and that's all, thank you very much. Uh, before, I just wanted to add, thank you. I saw that yesterday you were discussing inter um, uh, artificial intelligence and that there was a, a lot of uh, discussion on artificial intelligence uh, these days. So I have added uh, a couple of slides on artificial intelligence, which I will leave for you to have it. And there is also a booklet that, uh, that you can consult, um, the, 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 the blue one, exactly. So it's, it's uh, available on the website of UNESCO, or you can write to me. Uh, there is uh, there is the uh, there is my email and my Twitter. So for anything you can write to me. I sent you the the contact. So now yes, thank you. Thank you very much, <laughs> Thank you very much, Doctor Ernesto, for this wonderful conference. We have one asking for you. Uh, no, no. Hello, Ernesto. Congratulations. Very, very nice presentation. Uh, I want to come back to this problem of the pot potential negative effects of, of, of the open science in general, but I would like to focus on a particular problem which is affecting a lot here in Brazil, which is op the, the open access to publications, to scientific publications, particularly the issue of the outer processing charges. So everybody obviously wants to have all the papers to be opened and, and, and the international movement to induce most of the journals, so the large majority of the scientific journals to, to move to open, open access only. So all the publications are open access, which is very nice. But then, the pay-to-publish model uh, has brought several difficulties. So we have some data on that. If you look at all the publications in the world in the period of 10 years, 2012, 2021, only 0.3% of these papers come from the so-called low-income countries uh, which have waivers for APCs, right? 0.32%. So for the publishing companies, this is essentially nothing. So it looks like as if they are giving, I mean, good benefits for the poor people, but at the end of the day, that doesn't cost them anything for them. Then there is another classification from the World Bank, which is the lower middle income countries, which they give a discount for 
And if you look at those papers, they represent only 1.3% of all the papers. And in Latin America, no country, if you look in the World Bank definition of low-income countries or middle-income countries, none of them are, are there. So uh, for Brazil, for example, if you want to publish a paper, you're paying $3,000, the cheapest. Or if you want to have a very good result, you want to show the world in nature or science or sell, you have to pay $11,000. This is probably five times uh, the average uh, I mean, a uh, grant for a, a scientist here in Brazil. So uh, I think we have to look at that because this is creating a major barrier for Brazilian science and other middle income countries to really have rights uh, as predicted in the, in the human rights uh, 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 declaration, right? So I'm sorry, but no. I think. This is, I, I saw the document, the recommendation of science, and, and, and there is a, a sentence there about this issue. But I think we have to discuss it in a larger sort of approach. Uh, absolutely. I think that you're touching there, particularly an issue that is very difficult to, to solve at the international level because there are interests uh, that are not, uh, the interests of the different countries are not really uh, uh, going into the same direction necessarily. No? The, you know the, the European approach and the, the, the American approach is uh, somehow different. I, uh, and, and the other countries kind of have expressed the same uh, uh, similar concerns. Now I think that um, yeah, we, we are looking at, the, at, at an evolution in the publishing system, I think, that necessarily will have to happen. Um, I have no solution for, and I, I agree fully with, with, your, uh, with your statement. I would say that we need to look into it also from the policy perspective in, the, in, in our countries and see how from the public policy, we can look into it, how much we spend in, in, in uh, paying for, for publications and data in the, in globally. And, and then we have the Cielo approaches and the Latin American approaches, various. I saw that the, the annals of the, of the academy are in, in Cielo, and, and we have these other approaches that I agree are very Latin American and have a, have a very, maybe a different uh, scope, but that slowly, hopefully, this, this, uh, we will be working on, on different paradigms also for, for scientific publish, publishing. But I agree that I don't have a, a solution for that. May I? Thank you, Ernesto, fantastic. You gave us a lot to think about. I totally agree with Glaucius. And uh, <clears throat> I think UNESCO has to uh, take into their hands the discussion about the, what Glaucius uh, just said and also about open data as a yeah. whole. Because we are going to create this inequalities instead of the 17 uh, desirable objectives of sustainable development. And uh, I'm really concerned. I don't know the other countries in Latin America, but here in Brazil, Brazil is signed the form. And by December 2024, we have to have everything open. Great. The idea is fantastic. Who is going to pay for that in the country? How are we going? There is not going to be enough clouds, I think, to put all this information without payment. How is Latin America dealing with that, other countries? Who is really planning uh, on having this set up? Because the idea is good. And I'll see if you can comment I'll, uh, very briefly on the citizen science, because everybody understands in a way. And I would like to know how UNESCO defines 
citizen science. And again, thank you so much. And thank you for participating in all uh, our meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Elena. Uh, my pleasure. On the contrary, thank you for inviting me. Um, now, um, about um, uh, two, two points, about how to get there. The two, two proposals. So I throw the proposals back. This is what I do. No? Uh, you tell me and I throw it back to you. That's... No, yes, well, that would be the, 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 the initial one. But then I would say, why don't we call a meeting uh, with other countries in Latin America to discuss a virtual meeting? We don't need to... We, we can do a breakfast to discuss. How, how all the countries will, 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 so let's together, I would say, uh, the, the Academy and, and UNESCO call for a meeting to, to discuss uh, these issues to see how we can, how we can move forward. Uh, I, I, I think this, this could be a first, or we could, um, we could try to find, uh, uh, first do some desktop study and then call the meeting. I don't know, we can discuss, I'm open to, to looking into how how this uh, can be done, um, the second uh, or through the IANAS uh, system or through Interciencia or the different uh, ways we have to 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 for for cooperation, I'd be really happy to 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 look into that. And we could even bring that to the CILAC forum. We're having a, uh, we have an, an open science. Uh, we have a, a forum that is open uh, on science. So it's not an open science forum, but it's a science forum that is open. Uh, in English, it sounds in Spanish is Foro Abierto de Ciencias, no? Y no es Foro de Ciencia Abierta. Uh, but, but in English, it's Open Science Forum, and then you don't. It gets complicated. But El Foro Abierto de Ciencias para América Latina. There we can we can uh, talk. We could have a session to discuss that too. This is 2024 in in Colombia, so we could very well uh, have it uh, plan a session. Uh, there, okay. I think we have there. We, we have an agenda um, to to address the the, the issues, and uh, I think that that could be a way. About citizen science, I, I'm not sure we have a, a a proper definition. There is a definition from the European Citizen Science Association. Uh, there are a couple of definitions around. We could ask uh, Chat GPT too, um, but. Um, uh, we, we don't have one that, that we have agreed upon. The problem of UNESCO for definitions and everything is, it's not the secretariat who, who does that, but we have to, when we want to have something, we have to discuss with 193 countries, and the mandate has to come from the countries. So the countries has to ask, have to ask us, please prepare a definition, and then we can kind of, yeah, so again, you, the Brazilian ambassador, permanent delegate to UNESCO could bring up this issue as a follow-up to the, to, the, to, the, um, uh, to the recommendation, and this could, could then be moved, uh, happy, to, happy to do that. But the important thing is that me, as a, as a UNESCO civil servant, I represent UNESCO, but I cannot tell you what I think citizen science is. I could, but, the, but what I think citizen science is might, might not be what an agreed definition would be at the, at the international level. There is probably something in the thesaurus, but not something that really is uh, strong enough to, to consider an agreed definition. Yeah? Uh, that again, we can work on that, uh, uh, but I have no concrete answer beyond that. Thank you. <laughs> First of all, congratulations for your speech. Uh, here. Uh, I'd like to, to know if UNESCO could give for some guidelines for, for countries how to uh, interact with enterprises, with corporations, because when you talk about uh, a lot of things about uh, open science, uh, it's easier when we are taking the view over a public um, of a public uh, understanding, general understanding, but uh, there are, are uh, two aspects that I think there are important. First of all is 
When you talk about basic science, it is easier. But when we start to talk about applied sciences, or we start to talk about um, the technological development, the, the data and information it starts to be not so available, and it's understandable. It's understandable this 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 point of view, uh, especially when we 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 stimulate to uh, to try to do, to to develop uh, devices and to to go to patents and and intellectual uh, property. Um, I don't know. Of course, UNESCO would relate with the countries and not with the cor corporations of the enterprises, but maybe in a way to to achieve uh, better results. UNESCO could try to to formulate some guidelines for the countries how to uh, make some approach with enterprises. Since when we 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 go to this other uh, field of uh, of work for uh, trying to to achieve a, a really uh, open science uh, situation. Uh, the 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 role of the the enterprises, uh, I think, it it starts to 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 become bigger and bigger in in a country, and in a certain way, there is a a, a geopolitical uh, structure that we could see that some uh, uh, corporations have uh, the the importance of uh, sometimes of some uh, um, political country agendas, for instance. I don't know if I was clear enough, but it's a, a challenge that um, I think the world has to, to, to face. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Of course, uh, open science, we normally have it more directed towards publicly funded uh, science. Uh, also, because if we go back to the first slide, in the, even in the human right, Declaration of Human Rights, we recognize clearly the right for the person of the creator, no? the, 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 the copyright or the intellectual property. The, it's interesting that the, uh, 27, uh, the Article 27 of the Human Rights Declaration is about culture and science, and it goes from uh, copyright to IP a bit of in the same in the same uh, line, but when we when we so we are never we're, we're not proposing to abolish uh, uh, the um, intellectual property rights, uh, but work on those the, those areas where particularly are publicly funded. We clearly see that the that the knowledge that is publicly funded should be publicly available. Um, I think that. That is a matter of principle. Uh, now, the second part of your question about the relationship with companies, um, it, is, it is complicated also because it's not, not uh, universal. It's very difficult to have a universal uh, um, principle about that. Uh, we have a, a previous declaration, uh, recommendation, which is from 19, uh, 2019, about uh, science and uh, scientific researchers. Which, which is a recommendation on how to protect scientific researchers in, in relation with uh, the, the, the interests of the companies and of the states. Um, maybe you can find some inspirations there, but it's very difficult because also us as a UN system, we are only now clearly having a different type of cooperation with the, with, um, the companies. Uh, and we're working with companies now uh, more in the framework of the SDGs, but this was not our, it's not in our DNA really. <laughs> and we are, we are making a big effort. But I, I, and there I would like to say in a, on, a, on, a, on a different area that the, the longest standing partnership between the private sector company and the uh, UN agency is the L'Oreal UNESCO Partnership for Women in Science, which is since 1998. And that's the oldest, uh, the longest standing a partnership between a company and the UN, a UN agency. And it's not that old, it's, uh, yes, uh, so um, it's really 25 years. Um, so the culture of dialogue with the, with the private sector, uh, with the private sector that evolves very, very fast, uh, and um, yeah, we have still there something to work on. 
Thank you. Okay, mais uma vez agradecemos ao Muito obrigado, Matheus. Pela excelente palestra e pela rica discussão que tivemos nesse momento.